this session was meant to happen last week. We had some network difficulties, some problems between the Netherlands and Italy, and we postponed it to today. And the other reason I was very excited is we have an awesome, a stellar super guest today. She is a TEDx speaker. She's a consultant with some of the world's most important brands. And she's a phenomenal, phenomenal opinion leader. Sangrita Moitra, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Valentina. And you, you were the kindest with your words. And I, I rest assured that rest assured to everyone watching in that it's Valentina's very kind introduction that's flattering. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the topic today is one of my favorite topics when it comes to building a company, building a startup, and even, you know, beyond company building. We're going to talk about storytelling. Yeah. Why storytelling is important. I mean, I, I first met Sangrita after hearing her at a speech in Naples, in Italy, and I was completely blown away by the power of her words. She's a walking example of the things she's saying, right? So can you start telling us a little bit about, you know, how you got to the point where you are? Um, how did your career evolve into this sector? And what, what was the, that experience that you had um, that kind of shaped this, this career and this profession? So it all started when I was five years old, or I think I was four years old, uh, in my kindergarten days. And mm -hmm. I was in this uh, town. I grew up in this town slash city in India. And my English teacher noticed that I had a flair for for expressing myself with words. And she said, and she noticed that my English teacher, Mrs. D'Souza, she noticed that in my uh, elocution, or I was reading some poetry, and she said, you know what, stay back after school or after your kindergarten hours and let me teach you some things. Mm. And then she began to teach me and she gave me like a little poetries to little pieces of poetry to practice and read out and basically led to me doing my first keynote when I was five years old which was wow. very cute and nothing really it's nothing big but I remember my parents being so shocked because it because it was our annual kindergarten uh, cultural or dance festival for children like you know those annual events and I welcomed all the parents and I spoke for like five minutes and my parents were like our daughter can speak like this we never do you know so <laughs> Uh, growing up, I think also just has you always have those children who gravitate towards sky, you know, indoor skating or swimming. I was the one who took up public speaking. So in my childhood, I think until I was uh, in my late teens, I've competed. I had competed in over a hundred public speaking, debating, elocution, storytelling, oration competitions. And what that does is, number one, you train it like you train your brain and you train the skill like an athlete mm -hmm. because you're always training to compete. The second thing that it really did for me was, and I always tell people, whatever you're doing, you must throw yourself into a competition mm -hmm. and not because you need to be competitive and fight, but because when you throw yourself into a competition, you push yourself to find the best in you. Mm -hmm. And I, till date, even now at this very old age, no, at this rather mature <laughs> adult age, uh, even now I have found that it is only when I'm in a competition that I really mm -hmm. push myself to find my best. And that practice taught me how to find my best in my normal daily life. Mm -hmm. So I think that mindset shaped me from a young age to always know how to get the best out of myself. Nice. Um, then I was always, you know, from a young age, I was so fascinated by the brain, by mm -hmm. behavior, by communication, mm -hmm by why people think the way they think, why they behave the way they behave, what is the impact of our words. Um, and I went on to study neurobiology. So I specialized in neurobiology in my master's degree. I came to the Netherlands. I graduated. That was the peak of recession in the world. I think the world was just wow. recovering from recession at the time. So I went into um, the corporate industry to make sure I could provide for myself. But even then, I chose 
corporate management in neuropsychiatric uh, illness studies. So I was working in a very corporate environment, but I was monitoring the global studies in schizophrenia, in um, bipolar disorder, in major depressive disorder. And there were two things that it really taught me. Number one was being in a corporate environment, working with clients and vendors. I could observe how the power game works. And I'm just, I just happen to be the kind of person who loves to find patterns. And I could sense some patterns in the way there was a shift in the power game. There was an imbalance and how people were more focused on being a bullet list of skills than mm. really showing showing the decision maker who they are rather than just focus on what they do. So that was a couple of that was something that I really learned in the corporate environment. And mm. the second thing was working with these major global neuropsychiatric illness studies. It really taught me the impact of the brain on your behaviors, your behaviors, on your communication, and how that communication impacts the relationships, impacts how people react and respond to you, and basically the outcome of all those experiences. So what will be the outcome of your experiences, of your interactions, of your communication, because of your behavior? You know, so that is something that really fascinated me as well. So I think it was about 2016 or 17. In the meanwhile, I was also participating in a lot of debating public speaking competitions in Europe. And I won quite a few awards. So people started, you know, asking me, okay, or noticing me. <laughs> and then, uh, I had already started creating my own content by then, because even though I was so happy to have my corporate job, I knew that uh, I wanted to do something more. So I started creating my own content. Mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. you know transformation about what is the power of your story the power of your words what does it take for you to speak up and stand out and be seen mm -hmm. um and then 2017 i participated in a tedx idea contest and i won that contest so mm -hmm. out of like many many people you know you have to go through a series of rounds and then you if you win then you get a spot on this big stage and i won the competition for one of holland's biggest um, TEDx platforms, which was TEDx Rotterdam. And that's how I would say long story short, it all went. And then I got, I, I got invited by uh, clients like uh, Nike, Booking.com, Shell, um, Tommy Hilfiger, yeah. uh, ING Bank, uh, National Nader London, which is like the pension and risk branch of ING Bank. So I've been, uh, I do a lot of advising, I do trainings, I do speaking, st strategy. Uh, I've also worked with a lot of startups, uh, startup accelerators like Startup Bootcamp. Yeah. I spoke at Startup Extreme. And then I was at the Opus Fund uh, Enterprise Camp last year where I met you. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, in a little yeah. nutshell with uh, yeah. what right. I do and how um, it all started. You said yeah. something just now that is very powerful, right? It's a question. What does it take to be seen? What does it take to be seen and heard? Not only as a person, but also as a brand. I'm thinking, you know, in terms of creating that brand story, which you were talking about so much in, in your talk, right? What does it take? The most important thing for me, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, I see majority of organizations not doing that, mm -hmm. is you must and I say must with an aggression right now. <laughs> you must prioritize integrity over reputation. Right. Your integrity as a brand, as an organization, as a startup, as an individual has to be so true, has to be so pure and has to be so deeply meaningful that your reputation should follow your integrity. I see way too many organizations right now, a lot of which actually go through very bad experiences because they focus so much on reputation building. So they create grand stories about themselves. But in fact, on the inside, there's nothing. Right. So when the one time that news about them is leaked, their entire reputation comes crumbling down. So yeah. reputation is nothing without integrity. So before you... Yeah ask yourself and by you Valentina I don't mean you but I mean generally you people yeah. um, that you must always question yourself what is my integrity what defines me how am I creating impact and bringing meaning to the people I serve through my work mm -hmm. who are you serving through your work your mm -hmm. clients your customers your team members you're always every organization is serving some human being 
Yeah. It's serving something. So what are you doing? Then your brand story has to follow, will follow your reputation, your brand story, your presence will follow that intention, that integrity. But the intention and integrity has to be extremely clear and it has to be pure. Unless it's a pure positive intention, pure positive integrity, that reputation and that brand story can never be as powerful. Right. So that's something that I really almost push. Uh, maybe I'm using very aggressive words, but I really do believe it's so important. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. um, for example, um, I see a lot of organizations, for example, that that have that are focusing on uh, these job titles that have come up in the last six months that's called reputation manager reputation director and i think you know what you should name yourself as integrity manager integrity director because without that integrity your reputation is a is literally a house of cards right now uh, when you're building that kind of reputation as a brand you're talking about so many things that come to play right the visibility of the brand the brand identity the reputation. Yeah. So there's there's so many things combined. And today, having a story to that brand is crucial, right? Storytelling. No brand today can you know get away <laughs> without doing storytelling, right? Yeah. Um, how do you think new brands, new businesses, and new startups can work with that story that they're building behind their brand? Yeah. So I always say that when, especially when it comes to startups. Um, who are looking for funding, who are looking, you know, to be sponsored. You're always, you're either meeting investors, you're meeting stakeholders, you're meeting mentors. It's often a very competitive field. And when I uh, was a mentor at several startup accelerators in the Netherlands, one thing that was really interesting for me often was the best idea on the platform was not necessarily the one that got the attention of investors, right? Because there was something missing between the idea and how that translates into a very attractive, appealing story for the the audience or their mm -hmm. target decision maker. Broccoli might be great for your health, but if you serve it to me raw, I ain't eating it. Right. You gotta put some cheese on it, put it in the oven with some olive oil, have it at a you know it, it has had it has to be. At the right uh, setting, you you know your story is much like food. If you want to feed someone something, you got to prepare it right. Yeah. And I always say your audience, uh, you need to marinate your audience. <laughs> so <laughs> you got to marinate people. You got to marinate them well, get them interested. And when it comes to um, startups, number one with your story is I'm, I'm going to give you very clear, actionable tips. Mm -hmm. First, start with. Why should this person give me their time, their attention, their trust, and their money? Oftentimes, you're either looking for one of these four or more often all of these four. Time, attention, trust, money. Why should they give you this enormous gift and privilege? Okay. The second thing I ask you is because it comes to a story, especially for startups, whether it's your website, whether it's a pitch you're making, you have a very short amount of time to hook someone in. At the end of the day, your success, which would be getting that contract that, you know, gives you that money or whatever it is, someone who says yes to mentoring you, it's a series of three magic words. And those three magic words are tell me more. So the first time you speak somewhere, you, you speak at a pitch uh, event, all you have to do is to convince that decision maker and the audience to think, oh, this is interesting. Huh? Tell me more. What will that happen? What will happen then is you will convert your monologue into a dialogue because that person will walk up to you after and say, hey, Valentina, that was really interesting. Tell me more. You right. will tell them more. Your only intention with that discussion is for them to be so interested that they say, ah, oh, I think this would be interesting for our board members. How about you come to our office on Tuesday in the afternoon and we have a chat with our board directors? The right. second, tell me more. That gets you yeah. into a meeting room, you know? Right. So all you have to think is a succession of tell me mores. So right. start with, why should someone give me their time, attention, trust, and money? The second hack, so let me structure this as a series of hacks. The second hack that I would share is what would be, think of it like a slogan, okay? So Nike says, just do it, right? 
And every slogan has a very emotional feeling attached to it. It has a pathos, you know, pathos is emotion, mm -hmm. passion, connection. What would be the pathos of your brand story? How would people remember you emotionally? If L'Oreal is because you're worth it and Apple is think different, Nike is just do it, what are you? And I would just challenge you beyond even your startup and I would challenge you to think of it as an individual, you know, whether you are an Ahmed or you are a Yaroon from Holland or you are a Hanukkah or whoever you are watching this, what would be your slogan as an individual, as a professional? Start with that, because unless you know who you are, you won't be able to express what you do. Second step would be, what would be that slogan, that catch for your brand? Why would it matter? How does it relate to what your brand offers in terms of solution services? Mm -hmm. And the third hack would be, and I find it very, very useful, is if you had to compare your the work you do to to an to to a metaphor what would that be like for example let me give you an example i once did a workshop for um cancer specialists oncologists in the netherlands this was about one and a half years ago and i gave them in, in that training of course it was a long training i gave them an exercise i said you're all doing some kind of work i broke them up into teams of four everybody's doing something different yeah and i said imagine that in you have to present in the biggest oncology conference you've ever been, dream conference, the you have a slide deck, but the only slide you're allowed to use is a photograph. It's an image of something. And that something, whatever it is, whether it's nature, whether it's a scene, whether it's anything, that has to really reflect. It has to be a metaphor for the work you do. What would that be? And I can never forget what one of them came up with. This was a pulmonary oncologist, so a lung oncologist. And that team came up with this image and they projected it on the wall. This whole wall was filled with this photograph of a massive field of black tulips. Actually, they're deep purple. So imagine green field filled with dark purple tulips. And he said, you know, when the tulips are usually red and yellow and white and you know, different kinds of colors but the black tulip when it came out the farmers the botanists were shocked because this was not supposed to be the color this right. was actually a mutant tulip so what the botanists the farmers did then is they studied the genes of these black or deep purple tulips to understand what went wrong and by understanding what went wrong with these deep purple tulips they were actually able to improve the normal tulips and make them brighter, make them last longer, make, make them bloom better. So the same way for us, we study what's going wrong to improve what can be done right. right. And I think by coming up with these kind of metaphors, even though whether you use it or not is not important, but it's that catchy thing, you know, that you train your brain to think so sharply that it's, it's a very good hook. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I love the metaphor. And I love the way, you know, the way you're telling the story, this is so meaningful as well, right? Um, it kind of reminds me of that TEDx talk that I saw where you, you emphasize so much on the idea that, you know, your brand represents your values, your brand represents all those emotions, because at the end of the day, you're building an emotional connection with your customer yeah. or your user, yeah. right? Um, yeah. In building that emotional connection, what I'm wondering is, what kind of feelings can we generate in that customer? Because I always remember that phrase that people, it's a quote, right? People will not remember what you said or what you did. They will remember yeah. you for how you make them feel. Yeah. Um, what are those feelings that we can generate, that we can trigger in customers and how, how can we get there? Yeah. So one of the simplest ways to, I think, break it down and strategize this within your team as a startup is Let's say you're a team of four. Take out your pen and paper, sit down at a table together and ask one another, when my dream, my target customer and client comes to me, how do I want them to feel? And what pain, because everybody comes to you asking for something because they're being bothered by something. Mm -hmm. And they come to you because you are an expert or you're providing a service or solution that can take their pain away. So for example, on my phone, I use the Tele2 internet connection because I needed internet 
the previous internet internet uh, contract I had sucked. So I went to Tele2. They had a great contract, great internet connection, and they were very, very customer centric, very customer friendly. So I switched to them. So I went to them because I had a pain and they took it away. I was looking for convenience. I was looking for comfort. And that's what they gave me. They gave me reassurance. What do you as a startup want to offer in terms of emotional support and reassurance to your target customer or client? Now, let me tell you a couple of examples that come up. The fun part is every single human being comes up with a different answer. So even within the same team, you'll get different answers, which is great because that's these answers are actually going to be the backbone of that startup. But you will notice a pattern. For example, some might say, I want my client to feel challenged. I want my client to feel reassured. I want my client to feel recognized. I want my cli client to feel that they can trust me. I want my cli client to feel motivated. I mean, different kinds. So first you pick on that particular feeling, that pathos that they've mentioned. Let's say it was, um, I want my client to feel recognized like they're being listened to, that they're being heard, that their complaints are being registered instead of ignored. That often happens in so many, some of the largest you know, organizations in the world, they, people often complain that when we go to them with a problem, no one's ever helping us out. And that is like, that damages reputation like no other, especially in the age of social media. Yeah. So take that pathos, okay? Take that pathos and then build your story around it. So. You want your customer, your client to feel reassured or you want them to feel recognized that they're being heard. How will you make them feel that way? Is this feeling, is this emotion being rep represented in your every conversation? Are you representing this in your pitch? Are you representing this in the meeting you had with the investor? Are you representing this in your website, in your LinkedIn, in your social media? Every single aspect of your presence as a brand and as an individual has to reflect that pathos. Right. That's where you start. So it's really that detailed. Yeah. Right. Um, you just mentioned three examples uh, of very powerful slogans, right? Very powerful words that are today linked automatically to the brands, right? So just do it. We know it's Nike, right? Uh, because you're worth it. We know it's L'Oreal as well. So how do you define or when do you know your message is impactful? What makes a message impactful? What makes your message impactful? Well, first of all, as I, I have to go back to point one, when your intention is clear mm. and your integrity is strong, I think that's when it begins to be impactful. Right. Without that, you know, um, I see a lot of, but you will just notice, you know, when the story is lovely and flowery, but there is no intention, there is no integrity, there's no clear purpose and value, it's mm. not impactful. You have, to, mm. you have to be very clear on what is your value that you represent. The second thing has to be how you communicate it. You know, uh, we live in a world of social media where Twitter has like, how many symbols does Twitter allow? 140? 140 yeah, characters? Yeah. Or yeah, 120, right? I don't remember Instagram. the exact number, but yes, I think it's Wait, something like that. Well, Twitter's kind of dying out, except for if you're in coding, if you're in the <laughs> tech world or you're, in, or you're in the medical world. Those two worlds still use Twitter a lot. But for example, even with Instagram, if you notice, uh, Instagram allows only one minute of videos on its normal channel, not IGTV, but normal. Mm -hmm. So now, because so many millennials and Generation Z people use Instagram, they barely even watch TV anymore. Yeah. Companies have started cutting their advertisements, which on TV would be two minutes long. They've started cutting their advertisements to be one minute long so that they can post it on Instagram. Yeah. So what would be your ideal ad or message to the ideal customer would be two and a half, three minutes is now. It's got to be 60 seconds max. Otherwise, people ain't going to watch it because Instagram is going to cut it off. Yeah. So the time, the attention span has become so short. So communication is key. How are you translating your idea into such deeply impactful words with the right message, with the right questions, with the right hooks, with the right metaphors, with the right slogan that that the listener, that decision maker whose attention you want cannot help but think, damn it, tell me more. 
<laughs> so it really is down to a science. It's down to a skill. One of the things I often ask is, um, you know, the power of questions is so important when it comes to your story. Mm. And sometimes I think, uh, so whenever, you know, I have to speak somewhere and they say, can you send us a brief, like a write-up, a bio of whatever you're going to talk about? And I, I have a good laugh about it because what they get is just, a series of questions that I will address. And one right. time uh, the person asked me, but Sambrita, there are so many questions in the summary of your talk or, or your podcast interview. Uh, you know, can't you tell us, you know, the solution? I said, no, if I don't ask the right questions, they will not be triggered to find the right answers. Right. So you have to, you know, questions are provoking. And uh, let me give you an example. Have you heard of Simon Sinek? He gave yeah. this very famous talk, Start With Why, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, right, so 2009 was the year he gave that talk. And he asked a very simple question in his talk. He said, why do you do what you do? Mm -hmm. And not only his 20 minute or 18 minute TED talk, but his entire work since 2009 or perhaps even earlier, are you there? Okay, we, you froze for a bit. So I'm, yeah, you're, I you're back. for a minute. I'm back. <laughs> where Where did you last hear me? Um, so when Simon Sinek was doing the talk. Yeah. So Simon Sinek asked, why do you do what you do? Yeah. And his TED talk, his 18 minute TED talk was basically answering that one question. But you're kind of frozen up again. Are you okay? Do you have internet? Sorry. Okay, you're frozen again. Yes. No, it's okay. But did you did you hear me or did I get cut off? Uh, no, you got cut off when he asked the question, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why do you do what you do? And yeah. then I always get caught in the same part. The podcast is like, we're done here. This is the most, you know, this question is it. Oh, you're, you're frozen again. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no problem. Don't back. apologize. It's not you. It's the internet. The bat messed everything up. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so his entire 18 minute talk was focused on answering that one extremely simple but deeply provoking question. Because all these people across the world, they were listening to this talk and going, sorry to swear, but they were thinking, shit, why do I do what I do? I have no freaking idea. People around the world were listening to this talk and they were going. <laughs> and they were going. And I said, I'm sorry to swear, but literally they went. And people who've been working for 20, 30 years, they listened to this talk, very simple question. And they said, oh, you got frozen again. Is it my internet? Yeah. Hey, I don't know. Is it my internet? It seems fine. It's going to freeze for a minute, but just keep talking because it, it keeps coming back. Okay, okay. All right. But I was saying that uh, people across the world, they listened to his talk. They listened to a very simple question and they went, shit, why am I doing what I'm doing? I have right. no idea. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I a manager? I don't know. You yeah. know, why am I an associate? Why am I a consultant? Why am I an analyst? Why am I a shopkeeper? You know, yeah. like, and it triggered people, but in a positive way. Yeah. And his entire work for the past 10, 15 years is basically answering that one question. Yeah. Why do you do what you do? Right. And his work is answering that one question. So if you remember my, TED, my TEDx talk, I asked a simple question. How do you want people to feel when they work with you and why? What emotional connection do you want with the people you serve and how and why? And literally, my entire talk was serving to answer that one question. Right. So my challenge to startups, what is that one question that you are going to ask that decision maker such that it's going to ignite them to come to you to know more about how to answer that question? Because that answer is the solution that you will present to them, whether it's a, whether it's a knowledge skill, whether it's an actual product or service. You have to present, you have to create, and it has to be a short, catchy question, but it has to be so deep and it has to be so 
impactful. It has to be crisp and compact and sweet, you know. It has to be so sharp that the audience goes, damn it. Damn it, I want to know. Right. I can't help but walk up to this person and ask, freaking hell, tell me more, you know. Right. So the right questions are life-changing. Right. I love what you're saying. It's, it's very eye-opening, honestly. And um, I think you mentioned so many times today the fact of and, and integrity becoming more important than ever, right? We're no, we know right now we're in a context where everything is changing. The consumers you, so, you thought you had, you know, may not be there anymore. Even the products you were, you know, you were building may not be, may not have the same shape. They're not solving the same problem or answering the same need. How do you think brands can work their story around to, yeah. you know, to tackle what's going on with integrity, as you said? Yeah. Yeah. So you might have noticed, or anyone who's listening in might have noticed that the moment we went into isolation, now some countries went into like severe lockdown and some countries it was a little easier, like it was chill. Like in Holland, we weren't in lockdown, but we went into isolation. Right. Overnight, overnight, the next morning you w woke up, you opened your LinkedIn and you saw everybody's an online expert. Right. It was panic. So I think the trigger the mindset is the same that goes to the supermarket and who buys all the toilet paper they can see toilet paper pasta and i don't know why people are stocking up like they're stealing all the freaking flour and and yeast to make how many cakes do they want to make i don't know i couldn't find any flour and yeast so i can't bake a baked bread anymore but uh you know they were panicking and they hoarded it and i think the same brain that panics goes on LinkedIn and immediately wants to show themselves, oh, we're an expert, we're an expert. Right. Or right. they go and immediately they start saying, guys, 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 50% off, 50% off. Sign up now, sign up now. Now, in that case, I would say, with your story, with your integrity, have the courage to pause, to wait, listen, observe, to what your customer or client needs. What are they looking for? What is the true value that you can add in this time and place of crisis? For me, for example, um, I saw, for example, on my LinkedIn, Instagram, you know, I, I have quite a few people uh, who are trainers or experts, consultants, we're connected with one another. It really bugs me when people say, oh, you know, because of the current situation, I want to do a great thing for, for the next 48 hours. You can get my book for free. So write down below, comment below to get my book for free for the next 48 hours. And I'm like, really? 48 hours? And then what happens? What happens in the 49th hour? You know, so don't use marketing gimmicks to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Don't try to already create more stress and panic. You know, that the whole, you know, it's a typical marketing campaign. No, oh, no. 10 minutes left, 10 minutes left. Don't try to go into that typical bandwagon and stop trying to push your product onto someone's face. Yeah. Think for a moment, have the, have the courage to step back, observe, and this is the time to strategically connect with your customer and client. You can connect with your customers and clients. Sorry, one sec. You can connect with your customers and clients and you can truly build deep, meaningful relationships, but you have to be extremely patient. You have to ask them, how are they? What's going on with them? And you have to have the ability to let them say, you know, let's talk at a later time. You have to have the ability and the grace to let them ignore you because they're so stressed. Mm -hmm. And how you position yourself on social media is going to be, play a big role because right now people are observing. Don't try to sell because no one's buying. Stop trying to sell because no one's buying. But it's a great time to, to manage your brand presence. So either show your value by showing your expertise of observe what's happening in the world and write knowledge posts, write articles on how you think you can offer solutions regardless of the product you serve i mean you could write something completely not related to the product you're serving or you're selling but simply you know you're trying to solve a problem that your customer is facing write something like that the second thing is have an honest a very a very deeply honest discussion with your 
uh, with the person you're serving and try to understand what do they really need. Mm -hmm. I think right now so many people are trying to sell. And in fact, the other day I saw a post on LinkedIn where uh, actually a, a LinkedIn contact of mine said, people in sales, you need to keep selling. And the only people who were liking that or saying yes were salespeople. Right. Now, you know, I'm not saying that sales is not important because every one of us needs to be a salesperson because you need to know how to influence and communicate and persuade people. But you also should not be pushy with your product. So whether you, you know, as a startup, you know, don't be pushy on your investors as a startup. Don't be pushy for uh, whatever support you need or whatever, you know, you need to get to the next step. But observe what do they need instead of thinking, what do I need? Think, what do they need and how can I be the bridge to get them from this problem to their solution? Sometimes really, I think in a time of crisis, waiting it out, being very strategic, being shrewd goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Observe people, understand their behavior patterns, see what's stressing them out, and then see how you fit into that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, it always surprises me when even with uh, with leaders who've been in very customer and client-centric roles for over 25 years, and I, I remember last year I did this uh, role play sub exercise in a training I gave. And I had people in the room who had 25 plus years of experience in very client centric roles, customer centric roles. These are really senior people from across the world. Yeah. And I gave them a very short role play exercise. I broke them up into teams. And basically the intention that exercise was about one person had to play their ideal customer. The other person had to play themselves like the company. And the third person was the observer. And the observer was basically like the greyhound, you know, sniffing for patterns. I say, observe those patterns you see, you know, the weird, the yeah. weird dynamics of communication and what's being said, what's not being said. You're my team. You're going to observe and tell me what you noticed. Yeah. And at the end of that exercise, basically, we had 10 teams and all the observers said, everybody has the same feedback that we as a company are so focused on pushing ourselves to the client and customer like hey guys guess what we had a big change last year look at our new products look at the cheap cheap uh, cost and everything no one's a stopping and thinking hey customer how's it been for you the past couple of years how's it going for you what do you need what kind of situation are you at we really need to stop thinking from our perspective and start thinking from the perspective of the person you serve that's something i think is really important in this time yeah. And position yourself as a knowledge expert by making sure you're a knowledge expert, not right. just the reputation, but the integrity. Right. right. We yeah. keep saying, right, this is them. I mean, it, this this has been um, sort of repetitive uh, conversation in several of the quarantine sessions, right? Take this moment to talk to your customer, to your consumer, yeah. to your user. Use this time to really build that relationship, that trust because yeah. they don't know what's happening, you don't know what's happening, but that trust, if you build that trust in these moments of uncertainty, you know, it won't go away. Yeah. Another thing that I, I feel people can do and are not doing enough is, or they're doing it, but doing it the wrong way. This is a great time to strategically build your network. Now, what do I mean by build your network? Not not by you know sending a thousand requests to people just randomly online yeah. or just trying to connect with customers and clients this is such a great time to collaborate this is such a great time to be visible in the circles you need to be seen so for example with this crisis i'm doing a lot of crisis communication work and long story short i've been collaborating with so many different platforms that don't do exactly what i do but my work sorry hiccups but my work <laughs> intersects with what they're doing really well so starting next week actually i'm going to be giving guest lectures online for mba uh, for the mba program of a change management uh, degree in one of the universities in germany so this is a time for great collaboration so it's helping them because i'm someone who works with crisis communication and leadership communication it helps me because they're going to give me an official certification as a guest lecturer for MBA. You know, so this is such a great time to strategically build your network. Um, there's another, uh, for example, there's another um, 
HR, like HR uh, Academy that reached out to me because we met a couple of uh, months ago at a conference. And now with the crisis situation, the needs for companies have changed. The needs of HR has changed. The needs of employees and leaders have changed. And they said, Sangrita, can you do something about this? I said, you know what? This is such a great time to collaborate. So starting in, I think, a couple of days, I'm going to be contributing to them with videos and articles on crisis communication, on behavior change, on adapting to crisis. This is such a great time to collaborate. Yeah. This, I mean, right. I feel, I feel like this time, and not to like uh, misuse uh, or or be uh, be selfish, of course, but don't be that. But it's such a great time for people to collaborate with, with one another and collaborate to truly create valuable, impactful knowledge that can serve people and it goes a long way because trust me, people notice. People notice. Even the ones who watch you but never like your post or never comment on it, they notice. The world notices when you create meaningful content. This is a great time for content creation. Make it personal. Reach out to uh, as many platforms as you can and explore how can you together add value. If you approach it from the perspective of, I want to do this because I need something for myself. People are not going to respond. Yeah. But if you take it from the perspective of this is what I'm doing, I think what you're doing is so interesting. It intersects really well with my vision or our vision. How about we do this one thing together, collaborate on, I don't know, a podcast or a piece or an article or a product like uh, some people I know who are collaborating to create webinars who are collaborating to create use user friendly toolkits for people to use, you know. Can you collaborate? Can you do something to join forces and contribute to the people you serve? Such a great time to do that because people are listening. People are hungry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's a great way to to end this, this conversation on a positive note, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Because there is a lot of room for, for lots of things that we can do as entrepreneurs, as consultants, as, you know, independent professionals as well. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of things that will, you know, there is an economic crisis happening already now and it's going to get worse. Yeah. But also there's a lot of room for things that we hadn't planned for 2020 and for 2021. So, yeah, I think thank you so much for, for, for all these insights. Um, I love I love your vision and how you really you really embody what you say. You know the power of, of, of storytelling, the power of, of your words are are I think very yeah very insignificant, very powerful. So thank you. Uh, thank you, and I'd I'd love to leave this with uh, what some three simple words that I I so deeply believe in that adversity triggers opportunity, mm -hmm. and we must never forget that. Some of the greatest adversity experiences of mankind has led to the greatest opportunities and evolution of, of everything, whether it's technology, whether it's collaboration, collaborative efforts, everything. So adversity triggers opportunity, and may we never forget that. Yeah, great point. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Sangrita. I hope you're having great days in the Netherlands. As I usually say, happy quarantine. This can be a happy, productive time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's going well yeah thank yeah. you yeah i wish you the same and stay safe that's most important everyone thank stay you. safe yeah thank you so much bye bye bye